Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to CES, and welcome back to Sea Space Storytellers. I'm Michael Petricone, Senior Vice President of Government and Regulatory Affairs at the Consumer Technology Association. As a music lover, I am so excited to introduce this session, focusing on the marketing opportunities that arise when you make the right connection between brands, artists, and fans. Today, you all are in for a very special treat. Tim Westergren, the founder of Pandora, the largest music streaming service in the US, is here with the extraordinary entertainer, Nick Cannon. Both represent the innovation, passion, and persistence that make America great. Tim and Nick will share with us what consumer brands can learn from artists about generating user loyalty and affinity. So before founding Pandora, Tim was a musician himself. and He identified with artists who are struggling to gain attention and build a fan base. In 1999, he developed the music recommendation engine known as the Music Genome Project, which evolved into what we now know as Pandora. To make his dream a reality, he went $150,000 into debt, maxed out 11 credit cards, and pitched the idea of Pandora 348 times before receiving funding for the project. The result? An extraordinary and revolutionary service that delights over 250 million listeners and has paid well over $1.5 billion to recording artists. And Nick Cannon, where to begin? Nick is a startup entrepreneur, tech investor, rapper, actor, stand-up comedian, television radio host, and producer. Basically, he gets more done in one day than the rest of us all put together. On TV, Nick began as a teenager on All That before going on to host the Nick Cannon Show in America's Got Talent. He acted in the films Drumline, Don't Cost a Thing, and Roll Bounce. As a rapper, he released his debut self-titled album in 2003 with the hit single Gigolo, a collaboration with singer R. Kelly. He's the head of talent management, the head of the talent management agency Incredible Entertainment, and the creator, host, and executive producer of MTV's Wild and Out. And most recently, he was named chief creative officer of Radio Shack. Everybody, please give it up for Tim Westergren and Nick Cannon. Quite the introduction. Seriously. <laughs> I want to first apologize for what I'm wearing. I actually had a really nice suit and a top hat and a scarf. I left it in the green room. And, that, and it was gone when I came back. Oh, I got you. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to really a treat to, to be up here with you, Nick. And, and I'm not going to start with a long bio. I want to sort of have you tell your story. And uh, so much to talk about, as Michael said. Um, I want to start by going back to like the 10 year old Nick Cannon. Like, uh -oh. can you describe like what were you like as a kid? ADHD. <laughs> uh, I mean, yeah, I was a kid who just uh, hyperactive, loved attention, loved art, loved music more than anything. I mean, uh, I really, I was probably introduced to music uh, by my, my grandfather when I was around eight years old uh, through church and stuff. So being one of those kids who grew up in a church and can go dabble on a drum set one second and play on the organ the next second and stuff. So I, that, that world kind of allowed me to, uh, allowed all of that hyperactive energy to actually have a, a, a place, a ground zero to actually uh, surface. So that's where I fell in love with music. That's where I fell in love with entertainment uh, and just getting attention more than anything. <laughs> I was one of those kids that I just need, I, I needed to be in front of an audience, whether it was a church congregation, a, a classroom, that's what it was all about. For me. So you were you were on stage as a young kid in church, singing, telling jokes, the whole yeah, whatever you wanted. Yeah, all of that, man. I think I think that's when you see a lot of our, our entertainers come from a place like that, to where you can, you know, it's it's a place of, of hope and, and and love, and to be able to see young people thrive in that environment. You know, I did it all from telling Jesus jokes to, to, you know, singing in the choir, to playing the instruments. It was a great place for me to begin. And you were, you sort of a self-taught musician. Did you, did you take lessons at all? Yeah, I mean, kind of I never really, you know, from being in the band, obviously, in, in school and stuff like that, but it was always just picking up stuff. And, you know, like I said, I, I, I'm not a master at any one instrument, but I, I, I could move around in a, in a studio pretty well. So, uh, Everything's pretty self-taught, and just but working with other great musicians throughout my career, being able to, you know, get lessons from the best DJs and guitar players and drummers, and you know. And, the, and DJing was kind of a when you really sort of 
was your first kind of professional move, is that fair to say? Kind of. I mean, I started, I mean, it was during a time in the, in the 90s where, you know, get it, you get your, you throw house parties and you get your house speakers together. And you, my friend's turntable, I had one turntable, he had another turntable. Then we started doing things like we were pressing up cassettes and making mixtapes and selling them at school and, and all those things. So that's, that's kind of where I was introduced to the business of right it all, right. that I could actually create a product and sell it. Um, and, you know, to other students, other, you know, and then we went as far, I remember it was probably around 1995 where we started pressing up CDs. I remember we saved up a thousand dollars to uh, press up, I believe it was 500 CDs at the time. And, you know, we kind of put our whole work together and we produced it in the studio time and then you know we were selling them you know at different high school functions and stuff it was like wow this can i can actually end up doing this and then that's when that was probably around the same time where you know there were a lot of people that were doing that exact same thing but on a much bigger level like the master of right. the world and you know the e40s and people was just where independent hip-hop was taking off in a way where it was actually even cooler to say you had your own label and you were doing it this way then to try to go get a record deal. So I kind of came up in that environment of that, that DIY, yeah, right. like I'm gonna just get in and I don't need a label and I'm, I'm the label even though I was, you know, saving up my lunch money. <laughs> I still felt like it was something that I, I had the opportunity to do on my it's own. It's kind of perfect training for sort of the modern music industry, which is a lot sort of more and more DIY. Yeah, uh, man, 100%. I always say uh, if I, if we had, all of the tools and essentials that you know these young people have today i mean mm -hmm. i actually love the grind of yeah. of being able to have something tangible in your hand and trying to walk up to people and right. hey you got to listen to this and buy it. but you know this was pre-youtube this was pre-pandora pre myspace all of that stuff i mean there uh it was really if you were an artist uh, you kind of had to figure it out on your own and, and the only way you could connect with people and create fans were live shows. I guess that's true. I hadn't thought about it, but downloading kind of takes out that here's my yeah. CD moment. Like, hey, st hold on, listen to this, buddy. It's, yeah, and people don't, don't even have anything to play CDs on anymore. <laughs> They're like, what am I supposed to do with this? So uh, even though the, the idea of connecting directly with one-on-one, I think the connection is actually even greater yeah. when you can really connect with someone in uh, through the digital space because right. you can find out so much more about the person and, and more than that five minutes of here, please listen to this right. and give me five dollars for it. So, so you're so you're a kind of a high energy ADHD attention seeking teenager. Yes, doing lots of things, starting to press CDs. When does that? When do you say, hey, you know, this might be my profession? Like I. When does it start to turn into something more than just like a hobby and something that makes you cool at school, but actually, you know, yeah, you know, I might do this for my for my for a living. I would do things where like intern at the local radio stations, uh, talent shows. When when people start telling you like, oh, you you know, mm -hmm. you should do this as a career, then kind of like, I, don't, I do it because I love it, you know. But uh, a career you, when that's that time when you're in high school and you're figuring out what you want to do with your life and. Right where you want to go. So when those actually became real lucrative opportunities, I was, you know, we started to get paid for a few of the shows that we were doing, started to promote our shows. Uh, and then we even got into the space where we were talking to a few different record labels and management companies. It's like, oh wow, this can be something that's really real. So it, it probably did happen for me, like right towards around like 1996, 97. And so your, so, so, so music has taken off. You start getting, film stuff starts to kind of creep yeah, in that as didn't well really at that age too. Yeah, I think, I mean, it all was, the thing that really popped for me uh, early on was the music and stand-up comedy at okay. the, early on. And that kind of opened the doors because I was probably one of the youngest guys out there doing that. And that got the recognition of, uh, and the attention from Nickelodeon. Mm -hmm. and, they, and, it, and once I got in that world for a few years, probably for like most of my teen years, that's where I kind of established a career there. And then from there, that's when, you know, the film started to take off probably once I was like 20, 21 years old. So one thing that I sort of think as I look at your career is, um, you know, I think maintaining a healthy brand yeah. is twice as hard in the, in the age of the Internet because it's kind of relentless transparency, you know, like just right. you are surrounded by people watching 
you know, tweeting, retweeting, Snapchat, you know, it's, <laughs> and it's, I think it's, it's particularly difficult to, to have an enduring, healthy brand. I mean, a lot of people rise and fall on the web, and you seem to have something of an instinct for how to not fall in the trenches. And, you know, and I mean, the tabloids have been in your life. Yeah, you, yeah, yeah. you haven't lacked for people coming along to sort of make things complicated. Can you talk a bit about you know, when you started thinking about that and how you sort of shaped your brand and, and, and how you avoided so those, those pitfalls? Yeah, you know what, I, I try to have a bird's eye view. I mean, uh, so much about uh, today's marketplace and social media, is, it's so immediate and everybody wants to know what's going on in your life today and then they actually forget about it tomorrow. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's like, if you, you didn't have a bird's eye perspective of, I'm not really, that concern about you know being a trending topic today or the hottest this year when you're trying to when you have a trajectory of you know i'm trying to build a 25 50 year long career like if we started to analyze some of the people that we uh we call legends or that we love or yeah. that uh we're huge fans of we're fans of their entire career and it usually spans over a large period of time um I love the immediacy of social media and how you can connect and, and, and dive in with someone's personal life or whatever they're feeling, at that, that emotion at that moment. But that doesn't mean that that's going to resonate forever. So, you know, I might be hot and upset about something, uh, tweeting about it, or you see a, a post that I might put. But that's like, you know, that was my mood for the day. But when you're trying to figure out the career and what you're trying to build over a course of time, I think that kind of speaks for itself. So I kind of approach it from that sense. So if I do a film, if I make a song, I'm usually trying to create a body of work that will sustain over time. And hopefully your work sustains longer than the talk. Do you, do you have sort of a set of principles or kind of, you know, that, that, that sort of are your guideposts in, in the things you choose to do or not do? I do, but I don't. I mean, I just, I just don't want to piss my grandmother off <laughs> at the end of the day. <laughs> like, that constrains it. Yeah, right? <laughs> like I want her to be able to walk into the church and hold her head up high. Like she shouldn't be too embarrassed of anything that I've done, you know, in entertainment. So uh, that's kind of, I mean, at the end of the day, I always say like, that's how I, I try to be real in that sense to where I may say some things that people don't like. I may have some views that everyone doesn't agree with. But at the end of the day, you know, when you come from a solid, good place mm -hmm. that, you know, I, I, I truly try to put, push forward positivity. Sense of humor must help. I mean, but that, a, I think that's what it's all about. You got to have a sense of humor. I think some people take themselves way too seriously in this industry. Mm -hmm. and, and it is everybody, you know, they're so meticulous about how everything moves when it's really like, yeah, we kind of have to... It has to be more about, hey, we're especially entertain. We're here to entertain. We're here for the people. So, kind of how we embrace it. You know, I I, uh, I think you know a buzzword on the web is authenticity. People right. talk about that a lot. Totally. People try really, really hard to be authentic. It's kind right. of ironic. <laughs> um, but but uh, my impression of you, uh, uh, watching things that you do, is that you have a natural authenticity. Um, and I think that's, you know, in, even in your, the, the characters you play in film. Right. Uh, do you think about that? I do. I mean, authenticity truly is uh, everything, especially when it comes to connecting with people. You know what I mean? I, I feel like people can, can sense when you're phony immediately. Mm. And that is usually a huge turnoff a lot of times. So, uh, and it's interesting because in the different industries, specifically in music, you know, I believe people, music is all about a connection. And when you feel like there's a facade in between the connection, it kind of, it can be a turn off at times. So whether it's a film, whether it's music, it's, it's usually like how I'm feeling at that moment or how, how, if I'm trying to embody a character, what makes this person tick, what makes him real. And that's, you, you're always looking for the, the, the stickiness into how one, idea can relate to another. So whether that's music, whether that's film, whether that's television, it's all about kind of creating these conversations. How do you, um, I think musicians and brands has always been kind of an uncomfortable marriage historically. <laughs> musicians are pretty uh, prickly about right. being associated with the thing that's selling out, that's kind of not real. 
I think that's changing. Um, yeah. And I wonder how you, you know, how you think about when you're, when you're, when you, when you obviously have a relationship with the brand, how do you do that in a way that for your, for your fans, for your listeners, for your audience feels like, oh, it makes sense to me still. Yeah. You know? I, I don't know. I, I, I probably struggle with that on and off. Just, you know, you, I have my artist side and then my entrepreneurial side. I mean, when you think about art to its core, you know, you, it, when it's monetized in whatever fashion, you know, right. you feel like, ah, oh, it's kind of taken away from the meaning of what the art is. But in the day, we're in an industry, we're in a business, yeah. and, and these things have to happen. And if you're trying to be, you know, the most popular artist that you can possibly be, which then can also turn into being, you know, lucrative and currency and all of those things. Right. But, um, it's funny, I do certain things as, as an artist that I just do specifically for me. And, but then there's certain things that's like, oh no, I'm creating a television show. That's yeah. a forum where we're, it's, we're here to make money. We're, <laughs> this is specifically for the advertisers and the entertainment. And, or, you know, we're doing a film. Like all of these films that come out, all of, you know, these songs that we put out through major record labels, it's a business. So right, right. you have to know how to operate in that sense. So. When I'm playing that game, I have no problem. I play it really well, and I feel like, you know, ultimately, if we look in the direction of, you know, where everything is going with entertainment, it is going to be these advertisers who truly make the creative decisions uh, when it comes to commercial art. Right. Um, and I don't see that being a problem. I mean, creative people are creative people. So whether you're a creative in uh, a, a space of marketing and, and you can line up with artists, I think that's a beautiful thing. And you're, uh, and you're nurturing, you have a label now, so you're actually totally uh, nurturing young artists. So you, how, do you, how do you coach them, Rob? What do you tell them today? I mean, it's different yeah. you're trying to break out as an artist now. What do you? Just getting people to connect with you. That's all it's all about. How can you get your fans, your people to connect with you? And if, it is, if that is authenticity, then, mm -hmm. you know, that's a beautiful thing. But if it's something where it's a message that needs to be, be spread at the time, if, if, it, if it's a trendy thing, you know, I have artists from everyone who, you know, guys who create new dance moves and getting, you know, millions of hits online to, okay, yeah, that's the hot trendy thing of the moment, to artists who are very, you know, focused on their subculture and their, and their art and their passion and using their words uh, to actually try to change the world one person at a time. And they're not looking for the big bang of um, market me, promote me. So you have to deal with each individual in a different sense. And, it, and each artist, are, they, they want different things. Some people truly are artists because they want to make money and they want to be successful. And there's nothing wrong with that, you know, but then there's some artists who are like, yo, I'm an artist because I want people to feel my pain, my passion, my, my joy, and that's how I, I'm expressing myself. And I don't kind of put those two mindsets against each other. Either way, I think they both can coexist in this world. How do you find artists? Oh, today? I find artists. Do you just browse YouTube all day long? Or do you, yeah, like, do you nah, do? I do a bunch of different stuff, mm -hmm. man. I mean, obviously, I'm the host of America's Got Talent, so <laughs> that, uh, I, I come across thousands of people, you know, at a, at a time, you know, throughout the year. Um, it's funny, one of my new artists that uh, is actually nominated for, the, for a Grammy this year, uh, Kaylani, I met her on America's Got Talent, you know, and, you know, she was in a a group at the time and you know 15 and she's 19 now and you know we kind of developed that but I met artists online uh discovered them I actually just launched a, a new app from our company Incredible uh that specifically to that looking for artists and creatives uh it's called the Incredible app uh and really we're it's a social media platform but at the same time you can upload your your music your uh videos, whatever it is, just to, it helps me in my discovery process when I'm casting for a film, when I'm casting for a television show, when I'm looking for new artists, it's an easier platform. So it's a crowdsourcing thing or is it like a self uh, it's, sign up for artists? Yeah, that, self sign up, you mm -hmm. know, it's kind of like in the same way where one would sign up for Instagram or even MySpace back in the day, it's just like uh, a community for, for artists and entertainers and entrepreneurs that, you know, feel like at least for, you know, because that was one thing I get all the time, you know, whether it's on social media, whether it's in person, it's somebody handing me a business card or some content and saying, hey, how do I get this to you or how can I get this to the next level? So I was like, you know what, I got to build something 
that is an answer for that. And it's not mm -hmm. the quick shun off like, yeah, 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 yeah. Like, uh, <laughs> send me an email. Like I, I want to create a real community because there's so many people out there that are just looking to be heard. And, and whether it's a, a, a conversation, whether it's a critique, whether it's a, a, a helping hand, I, someone helped me out, somebody looked out for me and I would love to create that opportunity for many other artists because I feel like that's what we're supposed to do as artists, too much is given, much is required. And when you're, when you're at a certain level that you can help others, like to me, I take more joy and pride in, in helping out new artists than, you know, kind of at this point in my career focusing on my own. So talk to me about data. Like, that's a huge, that's kind of the topic du jour, I'd say. Right, and, right. And we, we describe ourselves as a data company now. You know right, I mean? right. Certainly when we talk about marketing, uh, with a, you know, a gigantic audience and all this usage information. Right. So you've got a lot of people interacting with you. Yeah. So how do you think about data and what do you do with it and yeah. how does it help you? They used to say uh, content is king, which I do believe that is true. But I say, you know, I would say now data or information is even <laughs> a stronger king. Uh, at the time, I mean, I never really understood it early on of, of, of the value of not only understanding someone's analytics and, and, and the makeup of, you know, the things that we like, uh, but to see the value in that and to actually really tap into the space of data when you're, when it's authentic. I mean, I hate to keep using that word, but when it's, when it's, when you can really uh, know how to market directly to someone and they receive it, you know? And, and I think that even for, for artists and for when creating content, that's important. I mean, when we do all the different analytics and stuff, when we're doing the research for, you know, what television shows people like, and, you know, me being the chairman at Team Nick and kind of going and doing our research of what shows are rating well and testing well, and what is this tween audience really uh, <laughs> focusing on? It's like all of that stuff has such great value and for for myself as an artist knowing what to create but then myself as a businessman as well to know how to market directly towards them what are your sort of weapons of choice for kind of online like interaction where do you sort of spend a lot of your time and uh is it social networks yeah is i mean it, most like, of the social sort networks of the, I, I i hate to uh quote Kanye, but you gotta listen to the kids, man. <laughs> you know, it's like it's it's really whatever, whatever the young people are really doing. Like, like you know, I I was forced into the world of Snapchat. <laughs> like, I was just like, all right, I don't get it. It feels like it's a waste of time. But then when you see like everything that's going on, and it's just this is the new way of communication for the moment. This is the hot thing, so you gotta be a part of. So, in that space, but then at the same time, then I fall back on the, you know, all the the traditional things all the way to Nielsen's, you know, I have to, I have to really be well versed in both places, you know, I have to know what the trending topics are, but I also have to know what, you know, registers with the, with the artists, or, I mean, with the actual analytics of, you know, these major advertisers and companies as well. So, um, you got a lot of, you got a lot of plate spinning. Yeah. It seems to be like your, your MO. <laughs> what, what are sort of the, talk about some of the products you have in the, in the hamper right now you're working on that you're excited about that's sort of new and yeah i mean like i said the incredible app uh which is then curtailing into the incredible network uh is just generating as much uh content uh and interaction in the in the artistic community as possible something that we just launched so it's fresh on my brain uh obviously being the cco of radio shack is really exciting for me uh, uh so what are you supposed to do for them uh, several things. Uh, the first thing, obviously, you know, I've, I've had a consumer electronics business for the last five years. Uh, I partnered with Monster and we did headphones and I did tablets and I was pretty uh, successful in that space. So that's how the re relationship with Radio Shack was generated. Like, yo, you're actually doing really well on your own. We should partner because they went through a whole resurgence and, and you know, I kind of went down there and gave them some, some interesting ideas of how to one, rebrand the store, how to connect directly with this new generation. And I mean, a lot of Radio Shack has kind of always been about doers and makers and a DIY gener generation, uh, but they've never put that out in their messaging. So I feel like, you know, as 
so it doesn't feel like a vanity job. I'm not, I don't want to just be an, another celebrity saying, hey, pay attention to this, but to really, you know, roll up my sleeves and get involved. So I'm, I'm in the, the office in Texas and we're designing everything from new products. So you're doing visual store design, visual all sorts of things like that. Visual store design, all the way to the curation of the music that plays into the stores. And, you know, I kind of get to tap into a lot of the things that I already do as a, as a producer, as a DJ, all of these things. And, bring that experience to, you know, Radio Shack's the place I got my first mixer, my first microphone, so, and they still have, you know, those type of things available for uh, this next generation of makers and doers. So that's just the messaging that we're shifting and putting out there as well. So that's really exciting. And then I've, everything that I do in entertainment, I mean, I could sit here and tell you about all the shows that were launching on MTV and Nickelodeon and um, everything that I do at Viacom. I'm, America's Got Talent, new season is coming. Like, you know, How many new, seasons have you been on the show now? Uh, this is my eighth season, I believe. Yeah, so eighth, eighth and ninth. Wow. Um, yeah, so we've been doing it for quite some time. Uh, and this is the first year that Simon Cowell will be a judge. So that'll be interesting. He's replacing Howard Stern. So that'll be fun. And then, uh, you know, a couple more films. I just I directed and uh, starred in a film that we shot in Jamaica that'll be out this year called King of the Dance Hall. Right off of the, you know, I just completed a film um, with Spike Lee called Chirac. So that's been getting great uh, critically acclaimed reviews mm -hmm. and things. So film, the, the film world is working really well for us in my company right now. But overall, it's just branding my brand incredible and uh, pushing it out there for the masses. You know, the, the, the incredible app story reminds me a little bit of a, the platform we're working on, which we talked about a little yeah. bit, which is... I think this is kind of, a, in some ways, a, a, uh, an example of what we'll see across a lot of different industries where you centralize an enormous audience and they interact with a service and you develop a lot of data on them. Right. And then because you have that information, you have geolocation, you, you can begin to really uh, essentially put the power of that in the hands of the artists themselves. You know, right. how, does, how does the... How do the people that are, whose music is on that service take it and turn that into value? And so, right. for example, right now we have a thing called artist audio messaging, which allows an artist to literally say, okay, I'm going to Kansas City to play a show, and I'm going to log into Pandora and see how many people in Kansas City have thumped up a song of mine. That's awesome. And I'm going to record a little 15-second audio bumper, and I'm upload it into Pandora, and this is something you could do right now, and it's going to play for that listener in Kansas City when they are listening to my station or music like mine with a prompt saying, hey, you know, this is Nick. Yeah. I'm coming into town to play a show. Tap the banner to, right. you know, uh, to RSVP or buy a ticket. Right. And we have sort of, we had this idea that maybe we can create a musician's middle class. Yeah, you know? I love that. We talked a bit about that. Yeah. But, you know, I think that there's the potential here to I, touch a lot of artists. Absolutely. And I think that's that. You know, I commend you and, and your company in such a uh, great way because that's what it's all about. I mean, it's as an artist, it, it's it's difficult, you know, especially in a world where you have the big machines that focus on the few, yeah. but you have so many artists out there that are trying to be heard and trying to make a living yeah. at, the, at the end of the day. So when you uh, that really resonated with me when you said, you know, musicians, middle class, <laughs> I, I think that gives hope in in this new direction of i mean obviously we all know that the music industry took a huge shift you know in the early 2000s and people were like they couldn't they felt like nobody could get back on the horse it was like oh my god we were <laughs> we were doing so well and then <laughs> the internet came and digital and downloads and all that uh, but i feel like now we're getting back to the space where it is actually really promising for the artists especially if we can figure it out and they the right models to where you can get in and you can really connect with fans. It's like, even based off of some of the artists that I have signed, uh, it's really cool to know like, okay, this artist has no radio play whatsoever, yeah. but they have 2 million <laughs> followers. And then in, in core, you know, 200,000 solid real fans that yeah. when they say they'll be there, their fans show up right, right. or their interaction or the, like that, that's amazing to me. Mm -hmm. And that actually, and you know, that goes back to authenticity and how they were introduced to those people. Because when you're, when you introduce an artist on a giant, you know, 
scale and it, the, the magnitude of like, oh, they're on this television show and they're performing here and they're on their songs on the radio constantly. That's a certain type of audience that you're reaching. And usually it's a little bit more difficult for those artists to sustain yeah. a long fan base. And, and, and you almost want to be that, that artist that started off with a groundswell slowly and then build, build it to however you can. So I encourage a lot of my artists to say, start connecting directly with your fans. If you got five people that love your music, cater to them. Because then that five will turn to 25, and that 25 will turn to 100. And, and it just will kind of continue to progress on. And then you have those people that ride with you for life. I mean, when you think about the type of artists that we grew up loving and, and the people that we embrace, you know, we can go to everything from a, a U2 concert to uh, a Run DMC concert or, you know, wh whoever it is, people that we would pay top dollar to this day to go see now, where some of these artists that have may have come in the last five years, mm -hmm. they were the biggest thing two years ago. You can't even remember their name yeah. now. So it's like to be able to create that middle class in which you speak to where people can really connect. You see that you're supporting their art and they're supporting themselves and, and vice versa. It's a beautiful thing. I, mean, I think it's a big challenge. It is a sustain, sustaining, enduring career is tough to do. Yeah, well, yeah especially I mean, with your own art. You know what right, I mean? Right, right, right. When you when when you try to to stay true to it and, and not get caught up in the systems, like it's definitely difficult. Well, I think that this, you know, we're gonna give the audience a chance to ask some questions. I think that you know you sort of embody something that is that we're also trying to build, which is it, you, you're, you, you bring together, you bring a big audience, you source artists, and you're bringing brands and advertisers and the commercial piece right. and creating a marketplace for it. You right. know, and, and creating a place where it works for the artist, it works for the fan, it works for the brand. And I right. think that's kind of the, the three-legged stool of the future here. You know? It is. Honestly, it is. And I believe it can be done. Uh, and not to continue to beat that horse, <laughs> but the, it's all about authenticity. Yeah. It is, it, it, it really, it, when you can do something that, cause there's nothing wrong with catering to the masses. There's nothing yeah, yeah. wrong with being commercial if it's truly who you are. Wow. You know, there's some things about my art and my personality that are as commercial as they come. You know, whether it's being the host of America's Got Talent yeah. or, you know, catering and, and, and to my, my Nickelodeon demographic, that's, that's a part of me. That's yeah. who I am when I'm, you know, I, I work well with kids. I have kids, you know, like those are the things. But then there's also some things that, you know, I'm gonna I'm a be on my underground hip hop battle rap world that's not gonna speak directly to yeah. that world. I'm gonna be on, you know, my, you know, loving jazz drummers, you know what I mean? It's just certain things that it's aspects of everyone. You know, we, we all have certain sensibilities to where you know, there's going to be some things that we enjoy commercial entertainment and some things that we're going to enjoy is going to be more artistic and, and eclectic environment. So, uh, and I believe that's even the beauty of, you know, when you, what you've built with Pandora is like you have that ability to, to one second you hear your favorite song that, that, you know, everybody knows and it's super popular and the next second yeah. it's a song that may not be as popular, but you, it still gives you that same vibe and you still have that same love for it. So. Yeah. 80% of our artists have never played on radio, so yeah. there's a lot of that stuff. Yeah, yeah. Cool. I, I'm having to open it up. Anyone has a has a question they want to ask Nick while you're in the room with him here? Can I can I entertain any questions from the from the audience at all? Anybody? Yes. Uh, hello. I think I have a question for both of you. First, I wanted to ask Nick. You have so many projects going on at the same time, and I was just wondering how you manage them. Do you have like a large staff of people uh -huh. or, or how do you get it uh, all done? And then I wanted to ask uh, Tim about Pandora and how it uh, has been successful in providing a platform for new artists. How effective has it been for artists to become known through Pandora and uh, with the shift of, of people really not buying music the way they, they were in the past and artists having to perform really to, to generate, to make money as opposed to selling records, um, how that's played out. Yeah. I, I like that. I'll, you go first. I want to know that, <laughs> the answer to that question as well. So, yeah, I mean, clearly, you know, Nick referred to it, there was that inflection point where CD sales fell off a cliff and that kind of redrew the industry. So, 
here's how I sort of think about it. I think that there is the real natural complexion of the music industry, if you look at artists and fans, is to have this middle, this middle class layer of musicians. There are a tremendous amount of talented artists that don't fit on radio, but have a large audience out there. And the job of technology and these platforms is to surface them to those audiences. And we have, on Pandora, there are about, uh, I think, maybe eight or 10,000 artists that have at least a quarter of a million people who uh, create a station using their name. And about 80% of those artists have never played on radio. And I think, what if we could build the mother of all tip jars so that they collect 50 cents a year from each one of those listeners? That's a career for that band. Now, how does that tip jar actually happen? What does it look like? Is it literally a tip? Is it they, they buy a little more music, they go to a show? Like, how do you turn that into patrons? And I think if you do that right, you can make it a real profession. I mean, the, my dream is that there'll come a time when the day you graduate college and tell your mom and dad you want to be a musician, maybe like Nick did too, instead of going, you know, oh man, you know, <laughs> how am I going to pay for your life for the next 10 years? They'll say, that's a good middle class life song, go get them. You know, it'll feel like a profession because it'll have some predictability if you're talented and tenacious. So that's how we think about it. I love that. Uh, and to your first question, I definitely, you got to have a strong team around you. Uh, and, and it's, it's pretty cool because I do get to compartmentalize a lot of things that I do just based off of time management, you know, even just to give you like my, my typical day, like I'm currently in pre-production for the next season of Wild and Out and America's Got Talent. So those t both have separate teams. So I show up to one office and focus solely on the MTV business and then go do everything I have to do for AGT and then kind of brings it all together. And I have like a, a hub in New York that kind of works out of my Viacom office and kind of keeps everything going. But it's definitely a, a lot of spinning plates and keeping them all together. But, you know, you got a solid team around you. It, you, can, you can do it all. And it's really time management, really. And, and it's really, to me, everybody always says, oh, you do so many things. It feels like one job to me. You know, when you think of the people that I, I looked up to over, over the years, everyone from the, the Bob Hopes to the... Sinatra's and all, you had to be able to do it all. You know, it wasn't like you just do one thing. These people were great businessmen and women, uh, great entertainers, hosts, comedians, singers, musicians, actors. You know, Bob Hope would do everything from host the Oscars to star, you know, star on a TV show to be on the radio. Like it's, it's, it's one of those things where it's a certain DNA of a certain type of entertainer that can embody it. And I think it's come back around full circle today where you, you kind of have to be able to, to do many things to, to break through. All right, I got a two-parter for both of you. It's kind of Pandora-oriented. So I run a startup. We'll do, we're 18 months old. We'll do about 10, 11 million this year. And we're an exchange between digital music services, artists, and brands. So we've got brands actually buying airtime on radio. We'll spend about a million and a half on Pandora this year. And the best Money we can well do spent. with you is we can buy a... Well, best we can do with you is buy a 30. We don't get any genome data on it. So I think about the world of like Google AdWords where a small business can come, put a song, put, a, put an ad up and see how it, it tests with consumers and then it'll have some implication on its, how it plays in organic. I mean, you guys are meant, I mean, it looks like your product is perfect for like the AdWords playbook. And then I also think about all these artists and now these brands that will, would be willing to pay for airtime. And then I watch what guys like you do in dealing with sort of this cartel that you deal with. I mean, you get so much slack, I feel so bad for you, because I think in many ways, I have, there's artists that are lining up the door that would pay for that exposure to be played to the people they should be, in the, you know, get to in the genome. And I think there are ways to do that, which is the second subject. What do you guys, like, what do you guys think about this? Like, why is it if it's okay to be commercial? Can a band, I'm in Texas, right? There's all these big country, you know, red dirt country bands. Why shouldn't they be able to put some money up and work with a brand or get directly to an audience? And why is it that people are arguing over pennies with you when honestly, I think a lot of them should be paying for you, paying you because they're in the long term and you could be helping them. So like, what do you guys think about that? I honestly think that it's, it's these systems that have been in place for so long mm -hmm. uh, that, you know, that's, it's kind of like dinosaurs move slow, <laughs> you know what I mean? They've been there and it's, nobody really wants to see change and it's, it's kind of like this has been the way of the land and, you know, there's 
certain curation aspects of, you know, this band, you know, whether, you know, we all know the, the radio politics that have been around in, in radio from the very beginning and everything from the ideas of payola to, you know, just if the relationship that this record company has with this person and they're in, in at the core, there's true value in all of that. That's what I'm saying. Like payola, it, I think the way the term payola and all that stuff was, it has this negative stigma on it over the years because of how it probably originated. But, you know, it's payola in every form of marketing. And, and um, you just have to know how to do it. And it's, it's those, I hate to say it because it sounds like this whole mystic idea, but the, the, <laughs> the guys behind the curtain or <laughs> the guys who actually make the business move have to come up and embrace these new ideas. But I feel like it's happening. I mean, uh, when you every record label that you go to or every even uh, uh, service that you deal with, they have these new uh, departments of these innovative marketing and, and you know all these cool uh, relationships and partnerships that are where brands are putting up the money. And that's why I think I said it a little bit earlier. I truly believe it's going to be that day where you know the number one artist in the world is going to be brought to you by Pepsi or <laughs> you know it's like it's just it's real and there's nothing wrong with that i mean because when you think about the the amount of their, their marketing budget like that you you know it's what like a a tenth of what they spend is like someone a whole record label's entire tire spin so i'm hoping it changes because I'm, I'm like you, I'm not, I'm one of those people like, I feel like, yo, people should be able to make a living and figure out a way to do this opposed to these people like kind of guarding the, guarding the gates of like, no, this is, this, you can't get in here or you're, you're not signed here or you're not a part of this platform when someone, and that's it, and you get those stories every once in a while. You see someone load something up on, you know, on, online and it takes off and you, you know, I, I'm truly proud of all of those people that can really break through, but is that the norm? No, not really. Yeah, I don't, I, I don't have an, any ethical quarrel with what you're saying. Uh, like Nick said, I mean, all marketing is, is a form of payola. I think for us, you know, the, the part of the um, promise that I think listeners uh, believe we're making for them is we're picking a song because we think you, it's good for you not because it's being bought. Not that there's something wrong with something being bought, but that that's the premise of, uh, the basic premise of Pandora. And if you break that, then I think it changes how someone thinks about the product. So uh, we've had that conversation, you know, many times, but I feel like. I'm not used to this, I'm not feeling necessarily wanting to know what's going on or something that I don't know about the higher Yeah. Yeah. So let me ask a question. How many people here have listened to Pandora? Awesome. <laughs> I like the sound of the hands going up. <laughs> um, okay. Actually, lift your hands up. Keep them up. No, no, seriously. Okay, now. How many of you, keep your hands up, if you would keep listening to Pandora if you knew that the music on there was paid for by the artist to play? Yeah, so that's, that's kind of our hypothesis. Interesting. Which is an interesting, like you said, look, it's paper, you can thumb it down, you can skip it, whatever, but I think there's something about the, the, the um, relationship you have with a listener that says, you know, we're just going to like do our damnness to give you just what we think you'll like, no matter what anybody else says or what they pay us or anything. So Yeah, I think that goes back to the core of what you're talking about with data. And as that starts to turn into like when you actually truly do know what someone likes and you, and even it's that it's, it goes back to art. And when you can, when you can trust in a brand that they're, they're delivering you yeah. art and, and it's, in its pure form and delivering to me, sorry, delivering to me what I like. And I feel like there's nothing attached to it. I think people do embrace that. But, you know, at the end of the day, we do know there's, there's something running the machine. <laughs> tricky. I was just gonna add, I don't know if it's an all or none. I mean, you've got SEO and SEM that sit side by side every day. 
right? And people choose to either click on the paid ads or the organic ones. And in the same sense, you know, you have like an ad supported environment or if people don't want to see the ads and they want to pay a subscription. So it's, it doesn't have to be one or the other. I mean, you could just as much have a music, you know, artist supported environment as you could add. Yeah. 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 Google's an really interesting example because you know, the paid searches only stay up there if they actually work for the listener. So it is kind of a, in theory, it's not, it actually serves the, the, the user, but yeah. Are you, are you heading somewhere else, Dee, or does someone else want to ask a question? Oh, there we go. Hey, so I actually want to uh, ask about the Music Genome Project, and I don't know if, if it's accurate, but I believe it's also what kind of powers Shazam and the way Shazam works. I was just wondering if there's uh, any other use that, uh, you know, the music genome is used for other than the creation of Pandora and, if I'm right, the Shazam, if there's any, are you working more on that, expanding that project at all to grow other services maybe? Uh, so not, it's not, uh, so the way the genome works is every song that comes into Pandora uh, that we decide to include in the collection, which is a curated, a curation decision, is listened to by a trained musician uh, and they actually manually scored along as many as 450 attributes per song, manually. It's fucking ridiculous, <laughs> actually. And it takes like half an hour to do, you know, a lengthy pop song. And when you're done with that analysis, you have effectively a fingerprint in the form of numbers, of, you know, scaled numbers. And then math allows you to connect that song to other songs. And what's key about it is that it's, that connection is blind to popularity. So Nick was saying, you might hear a great artist and the next artist is completely unknown. Pandora doesn't know that that artist is independent or there's no, it's blind to it. So it's a level playing field. It's the one form of recommendation in the world that's not based on prior popularity. That's why it can serve unknown artists. And, you know, we're just trying to keep our heads above water using it for our current product. We don't really have plans to I do want to eventually rig it so it plays my music a lot everywhere <laughs> so I can get people to band back together, but no, it doesn't have another purpose. <laughs> yeah. so we have time for one more, I guess, if there's another question. Anybody else? Oh, yeah, way over there. Hi. Um, so I was wondering, as far as, uh, I know that you said that, or you pitched this multiple, you know, many times uh, over, you know, back when this was all starting out. And I'm wondering what it is that you think kind of started to make things click for people as you started to approach the actual uh, eventuality of getting funded and, and uh, you know, how Pandora was created um, initially with the financing and then maybe also to developers. Like what you just explained about saying, you know, we're going to get a musician and they're going to sit in a room and they're going to, you know, set all these attributes. That's now, I mean, as a, if, if I was a musician, I would say that I'd be honored to do that, you know, <laughs> but, but, you know, starting out, somebody might be like, that's crazy, you yeah. know, so how do you think that started to translate and, and maybe what were you able to pick up along the way of learning, you know, how to accomplish that? And then also for, for Nick, um, my friend wanted to know if there's going to be a Drumline 3. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, that's, yeah. There should be. I don't know if it, was, it should have been a Drumline 2, to be honest with you. Oh, well, uh, then, then that's, uh, but, okay. Yeah, now, the, we did Drumline, and it was actually supposed to turn into a television show. And, like, so the, that was a great film. The first uh, mm -hmm. pilot of, the drum, of drum became Drumline 2, but that, it was supposed to be a television series. So. There, but there's always talks of, you know, my character being reprised and possibly, you know, going on. And, Do you play snare like that too? Uh, I learned how to play snare in core style. I played standard set, all, you know, but oh, okay. then I had never did core style. Before. But you learned it. Yeah, right? until we did the film. That's so, not easy to do. Yeah, not at all. Especially the timing and marching and mm -hmm. stuff. That's, it's, it's truly a, a sport. You have to be an mm -hmm. athlete to be able to do it. <laughs> so, uh, so the, to your question, so I, I founded Pandora in 2000, which is a really bad idea right before everything collapsed. And so funding kind of dried up for everybody, especially in music, because that was when Napster hit. Like everybody thought the music industry would disappear. And yeah, I mean, I just got told no 
347 times. And mostly the no happened when they looked at the slide that showed the Music Genome Project. I said, ah, that's insane. I'm not going to fund it. Right. And I guess the funding eventually happened for a few reasons. One, the product really worked. It wasn't a radio product originally. It was just a recommendation engine. But you could put a song in this little demo and cough up 10 similar songs. And it was really kind of magical. And people saw that. Um, and, and so that, that was, it worked. And um, the guy who led the round was a drummer. That explains it a little bit too. You know, not quite all there in his head. <laughs> um, and wanted to invest in music. And I think, frankly, that, you know, we went about, there were about 50 people. We, we ran out of money after about a year, and, and about 50 people worked without salary for two years. Um, it's illegal to do that in California, actually. <laughs> um, and, uh, and I think eventually he said, hey, I, I want to invest in this company because they just won't go away. Like, they're going to, they're this tenacious. Maybe we sh they'll figure this out. We'll put some money in and see if they can do it. So, you know. But. Well, thank you guys, and thanks, Nick, yeah, for yeah, taking yeah. your time thank out you. of your insane schedule for no coming problem. here. All thank right. Appreciate it, man. This is fun. <laughs>